I was really surprised when uh, Chris was looking at the, the Gospel of John, and he looked at the text that refers to, um, and they shall surely not die, uh, from um, John 8, as I recall. And he was saying, yeah, that's just ume, uh, that's a, you know, that, that, that's just a, that, that doesn't mean forever, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I, I was running as I was listening uh, to this, and I couldn't help but, but think of Jesus' words of John 10, 28, and I will give to them eternal life, kai ume apolontai aiston iona. I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. Now, literally, it's ume with a subjunctive, aiston iona. H how, how else could it be expressed? Uh, it was really concerning to me that there's such a an emphasis, and in fact, I would say the the, the primary um, concept I came away from the video, listening to the video with, was imbalance. Such an overemphasis in the one area, because this has become the big area. I mean, if if you can hear yourself and everything I'm saying about a secular agnostic guy, this is you know not a lot of imba not a lot of ba balance there. But it does seem that to say, well, that doesn't mean eternally, has to fundamentally then bring into question the promise of eternal life as well. Be because you have ume, they shall never perish. I mean, that's the promise positively that defines what eternal life is in John 10, 28. So I was really surprised when I, when I heard that, it's like, there's obviously more here that, that I'm not seeing because what I discovered, I think is that eventually, um, Chris got around to the argument that I presented at the end of the review of Ehrman about sinning and the fact that you are not sanctified when you die. And if I understood what he was saying, it was, it was not the clearest explanation. But if I understand what he was saying, he doesn't, he believes that the punishment is simply death, cessation of existence, that there is no punishment. So it's, so it's not his argument that eternal punishment is unjust based upon um, the injustice of the amount of times issue that I was talking about before, which is one of the most common forms of argumentation. And so it, it sounded to me like what he was saying was, no, um, there's judgment, and then the only punishment is cessation of existence, annihilation. Now, in the process... Um, well, and, and my, my response to that would be that really, I think, is significantly more problematic than the person who recognizes that that creates an injustice in and of itself. Um, but I, if I'm understanding the, his position over against others, and I may have... I know I don't know if he's changed his position over the years. Um, I don't know if there's been development. I don't know. I'm sorry. Following that particular saga has not been my highest priority. I apologize, but um, I had understood that he did believe that there would be punishment, but that it would be limited in duration, followed by annihilation. If I understood his response to me, that's not what he believes. Um, okay, wh wh whatever. But what was interesting was the things that were ascribed to me. Basically, what he's saying is that uh, what I believe 
is that the unrighteous dead are given eternal life. That they are resurrected and made immortal. So you can see that there is a um, issue here about one of the key issues is when God creates man in his image is man's spirit intended to cease existence together with his body. So there is a lot of anthropological um, discussion here as to what the nature of man is. Um, and in my experience, don't know if this is where he's coming from, but in my experience, you have people who take the limited categories of Old Testament revelation, force them on the broader categories of New Testament revelation, so that indications such as uh, that where I am, they may be with me also. Uh, is better, which you know, which is better for me to remain with you or to be to to die and be present with the Lord. The idea of being present with the Lord on in Paul's perspective, uh, the activity of the martyred souls. There's obviously more in the New Testament than there is in the Old Testament when it comes to this issue. And in fact, most of what you have in the Old Testament scattered allusions that can only be. Um, uh, given much flesh once we look at New Testament revelation on the subject. Uh, but even then, there is significantly less biblical revelation on these subjects than the broad assumptions of most people assume there is. Or there's a whole lot more broad assumptions that people have that doesn't actually have a biblical foundation to it. Let's put it that way. So, um, so what, what about this idea that what we're actually saying, so you need to understand what they're saying. What they're actually saying is if you believe, if you do not believe in conditionalism, if you not believe that man's continued existence is conditioned upon the continued sustaining of his existence by God's power. And so it's conditional upon what God is doing in regards to maintaining or not maintaining the existence of said person. Then their argument is that everybody gets eternal life. Everybody gets eternal life. It's just a matter of where you get to do it and what you're going to be doing while you're doing it. Okay. I didn't refresh my water, so all I've got is my apple cider vinegar. Anyway, um, so how do you respond to that? How do you respond to the accusation um, that what we really believe is that everybody gets eternal life? Well, you immediately see that that kind of accusation or statement is utilizing different meanings for what eternal life means. Because we have eternal life right now as believers in Christ, and the un unbelievers do not, but they're still alive, and so are we. So there's obviously a different category, isn't there? John chapter 5, you've passed out of death into life, right? Eternal life is something we possess right now. So is what we possess right now ever going to be given to the unregenerate. Well, of course not. So to say that I believe that they will be given eternal life is to obviously change the meaning of the phraseology to communicate something that misrepresents what I would believe. They're not given eternal life, but they are placed under the judgment of God in the same condition. Well, they're under the judgment of God right now, right? The wrath of God is being revealed. And then the, the Petrine passages that they are kept under punishment until the day of judgment. And then at the day of judgment, you have the concept of basanismas, torment. So I'm not in any, so, so there is no meaningful fashion whereby you can describe simply the continued existence in rebellion from, separation from, 
absent of the life of God, of an image bearer as eternal life. That is, that is using it to mean one thing over here, and then using the exact same phrase over here and playing on those two different contexts in a very invalid way. And I did not appreciate that. For anybody to sit there and say, James White is saying that the unregenerate are given eternal life is to... You got stay away from the lighter. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna bring it in here someday. I'm gonna remember. I'm gonna remember. I would just suggest to you that if I have to keep dealing with Ken Wilson, you had better get a fire extinguisher right over. There. You know where you got one close? Good. All right. Is it charged up? Most of ours check your fire extinguisher, folks. Most of them aren't even charged up anymore. I hate to tell you that. You've just seen it there. It's been sitting in your kitchen for 15 years. It's dead. <laughs> when you need it, you ain't going to have it. So check it check it out. Uh, anyway, uh, that was misrepresentational. Um, obviously, the unregenerate dead do not have eternal life. The question is, what is the nature of the punishment? And then what is the endurance, period of, uh, of endurance is, is the issue. These are not the topics we talk about most. A lot of people in this audience, they've heard me talk about the subject of grieving. And one of the things I say when I talk about the grieving book that I wrote is, we as Christians really stink at talking about death. But you know what? Most Americans do. It's, it, that, that's more of a modernistic type thing. There was much more discussion about it in the past. That doesn't mean it was critical thought. Um... There was a lot of traditional thought. I, it's, it struck me over the years, doing a little church history here, it struck me over the years that there's a great video, and those of you, you know, who are like Algo, you've heard me mention this a thousand times before. We always have new listeners. Um, there's a great video on Martin Luther. It's the BBC version called Martin Luther Heretic. It's shorter than the full... Uh, Jonathan Farn. Was it Jonathan Farn? No, or was that the one that was BBC? I'm horrible with actors. Um, and which one was which? I think Jonathan Farns was in the BBC one. Anyway, it's called Martin Luther Heretic. It's my favorite. Um, and one of the things that it really brings home right toward the beginning in the formation of Luther's entire psyche is the centrality of death and the nearness of death. Remember the, the, the thunderstorm incident? Um, when you live with the reality and it sort of has some small connection, though the numbers aren't the same, some small connection to what we've been experiencing recently. There are, I, I know people who are living in mortal fear of their lives. They are panicked. They really think the zombie apocalypse has arrived. And when you have that fear of death, you will, your mind will constantly be dwelling upon the afterlife. Now, what's weird in our day, it's not quite the same because Luther was facing plague and death and war from a supernaturalistic worldview. But when you approach these things from a naturalistic worldview, the results are going to be different. You will still think about death, but there's this big blank spot afterwards. Meaninglessness, nihilism becomes the real issue at that point. But the reason that men responded to justification by faith was because they recognized how close, how mortal they were, how this physical life would soon be over and could be over very soon. As in today, tomorrow, the next day, everybody had seen a dead body in the streets. Everybody had seen dead children. Everybody had seen starvation, plague, war. It was all around them. It makes you much more serious 
about thinking about the nature of mankind. And so, sure, there was a lot of discussion about these things, but traditional understandings, that doesn't make them right. We have to back up what, we're, what, we, what we believe. There has to be serious thought. But this, more than almost any other subject, requires us to bring into our thinking multiple threads of biblical reality and biblical truth. So what is God seeking to accomplish? What is the nature of man? What is the nature of justice? Why does, why does the Bible talk about punishment? And is that punishment simply annihilation? Is it simply cessation of existence? Is there, is there a correspondence? When, when we talk about the death that Christ died, what is the nature of the substitutionary element of that? Is it necessary that Christ be the God-man for his death to be propitiatory for many people, all who are united with him? And what is the relationship of the nature of his person to the atonement that is offered? And again, church history... is important to understand here, but it's insufficient to give us an answer. It helps us to evaluate our answers, and we, we cheapen the answer we give if we are not aware of the answers that have been offered in the past. So, what have you heard me saying in the Ken Wilson stuff recently? What have I said a number of times in the background information? There wasn't a major treatise on the subject of atonement until the 4th century. So that was not where the focus of their attention was. When you have early writers who address the subject because they are forced to by something outside, because the consistency of Christian revelation has not been worked through and we don't have the, the the shoulders of giants stand on people come up with some really weird stuff so we need to have an eschatology and a concept of the judgment that takes into consideration a whole lot more than just simply a few proof texts on let's let's put it this way I think the meaning of Basanis Mas is important. I think that the parallel in Matthew 25, 46 is important. Yes, Chris, I listened to what you said. And it was un very unconvincing to me. But the um, point is, I heard it. And I can see why you're extremely concerned about that particular text. Um, but what I'm saying to people on my side is, for most of us, we have held to a position, and we don't know why we hold to it. It's tradition. And let's just put it this way. Um, people like Chris Date challenge us to know why we believe on the subject. And I'll tell you one thing. Most people haven't responded to him overly well. There are some people out there, but this is just the subject people don't want to talk about. And the reason I haven't adopted that perspective is because I see it to be in conflict. And see, Chris says, and this is why I believe it the way that I believe it, in his particular view. Fine, great. I'm glad that that's what you think. But issues of justice, anthropology, Atonement are generally not the context in which our eschatology has been formed. You see where this was all coming to this. This you want to hear what the 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 end of the week exhortation is here. We spent a lot of time this week in historiography, being fair to early church fathers recognizing the abuse of early church fathers and all the rest of that stuff. 
Okay? Theologically, the challenge for us is that we need to be honest when there are parts of our theology that are basically unformed because we have not wrestled with what are the real constituent factors of that theology. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you have simply adopted a traditional understanding in any area without seeing what the foundations are and the consistency of those foundations, that's going to be a weakness for you. And in my experience, once somebody pushes upon an area of our theology that we have formed out of tradition, we tend to respond with emotion, first and foremost, because we know that we have a weakness there. And we know that if you push us too far, there's nothing, I got no place left to go. I've never really thought through what this is all about. And so we want to have a consistent theology.